Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next session, uh, Leveraging Human Rights-Based Approach to Infrastructure Development in Southeast Asia. We have some, a wonderful panel today, uh, going to share their expertise on the uh, use of a human rights-based approach to development in Southeast Asia, uh, looking at the various different infrastructure um, projects, what kind of challenges uh, are related to these projects, and sharing some of their experiences on best practices and ways that we can move forward uh, on the BHR agenda. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass on the, the mic to Nang Won Lee, who is a grassroots uh, community leader and local researcher from Myanmar. She's been working in the governance of uh, river basins and working with activists and human rights defenders, uh, looking at marginalized communities and how they can share their voices to influence in positive ways business and developments. Nang Won Lee, over to you. Uh, thank you, Robert, for the brief introductions. And first of all, I would like to thanks to the uh, working group for inviting me to be part of this panelist. Yes, uh, as uh, Robert uh, earlier uh, in, um, uh, introduced, I am Nang Wan Lee from uh, Luka Activist, as well as the Luka Researcher currently based in Thailand, Chiang Mai. Uh, to address our guide, uh, guiding uh, questions, um, for this particular section, uh, integrating human rights and environmental uh, con uh, consideration is a fundamental and it is a very good foundation for sustainable development with uh, balanced uh, social harmony, economic uh, growth, and uh, environmental sustainability through the practice of responsible business. So we don't need to negotiate with our future or next generations uh, from being over exploitation of natural resources. But if we fail to comply the responsible uh, edicts to business sector, especially uh, infrastructure project, there will be a series of human rights violations and a number of challenges uh, to continue hinder equitable uh, distributions of um, um, benefits uh, from the infrastructure projects. Uh, as a long-term um, consequences impact, uh, we will also encounter with global crisis such as um, man-made uh, uh, disaster, natural disaster, and the climate change as a whole. Reflecting from my experience working with a, a grassroots leader and community member from uh, a Muji Dam's area, I would like to share about our uh, Muji Dam project. This project is uh, rather small, very small, but it is a multi-purpose uh, a hydropower project at the same time also uh, plans to uh, provide water uh, for the farmlands from the irrigations. This project is pretty small and the capacity, the install capacity is 15 uh, megawatts and also plans to provide uh, 82,000 acres of farmlands from the irrigations. Uh, this project is based inside uh, inside uh, Shan State, but at the border of Shan State and the uh, Mandalay Division. Mandalay is the second biggest of uh, city in our country, in, in Myanmar. And uh, 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 physically, this project is based in Shan State, uh, where a lot of minority uh, group people are living, but uh, the product or the electricity is planned to uh, provide to the big city. Because of this dam project, uh, for uh, this project was uh, um, operated in 2016, and because of this dam project, uh, four uh, communities were uh, forced uh, forced to relocate it from their farmland and homeland, and the other two communities were uh, they are caught behind of the dams because of the reservoir. Uh, with the reservoir fill up. Uh, fill up with water and the, their roads, uh, their roads uh, were uh, submerged under the reservoir. And since then, they became divided from the other communities. And uh, um, 
since they have no more road, uh, they cannot access. Since then, they could not access to the basic needs such as uh, um, hair, uh, basic health care, um, education, communications. They can't even uh, make a phone call or they could not travel uh, easily from their homes to another, another nearest city because of no, uh, no roads. Uh, from uh, being damaged from the dam project. So uh, in order to connect to an, the nearest town, it takes five to seven hours uh, with uh, different modes of transportation, walking, um, uh, passing uh, a lot of a uh, river, and also taking the boat and, and another uh, uh, like uh, motorcycle to, uh, to the closest town. So financially, they are not stable because they could not make any income at all since the dam project because they could not export their uh, agricultural product and garden um, um, the fruits and vegetable from their gardens to other country uh, to uh, other townships so uh, that's why this community uh, this two community trying uh, they make efforts to build um, to build a, a road to connect to the nearest town um, they, in 2018, the, 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 the roads almost completed, but the government did not, uh, did not acknowledge uh, their efforts, also did not allow them to use these uh, roads because uh, it has been accused that the road is uh, in the forest area. That's why they cannot give the permission to use it. So this community are uh, left behind and are still isolated from the other community. So uh, when um, uh, to uh, to see the clear picture of this project, if it is a uh, really benefit or not. So it's uh, because it's failed to uh, as, um, uh, as, uh, collaborate with uh, like uh, responsible edicts. There's no equitable distribution plan and management. So that's why this benefit didn't uh, go to the um, uh, many people as much as they uh, expected. Um, to address uh, the second questions about um, the, how the mechanism are being um, being um, put in place in, in practically uh, some mechanisms such as uh, social impact assessment, health impact assessment, uh, uh, also environmental impact assessment, so a uh, corporate social responsibility and uh, uh, like a free prior informed consent. So this becomes a requirement, part of the requirements in many countries in Southeast Asia. So uh, the, uh, this kind of mechanism have, have to be conducted, have to get approval before the, the project get to studied. So uh, in theory, on the paper, it looks very good, but in practically, it is not really uh, in a, uh, uh, it is not good because there are a lot of gaps and also lacking um, some, uh, uh, some investor or, uh, did not, they, they are not, uh, they are lacking to comply those safeguards, policy, the regulations. And in um, the nature of mega hydropower development project, it can pose a lot of risks and problems to the livelihood of people, to the uh, uh, to the wildlife, animal, fishes, uh, ecosystem, biodiversity, and then the natural beauty. So that's why uh, for the mega hydropower project or infrastructure project, it is very essential to have a very comprehensive environmental impact assessment and uh, the proper design, proper compensation plan, mitigation plan should should be really carefully um, have this kind of set. And cost analysis is also very important, not only talking about the physical, uh, physical um, uh, costs like a hydropower uh, project itself or maybe transmission line uh, costs. Uh, beyond of this, we should also consider about social and environmental costs that, can, uh, that could associate with this uh, infrastructure project. So I would like to also share the one case study about Mung Don Dam project. This project is uh, uh, has been proposed to be built for several decades. This is a very big, uh, very big. Uh, it's going to be the biggest in Southeast Asia if 
it is built. So this project will be located in Shan State, uh, where I'm coming from, Shan State in Myanmar. So this, uh, the capacity, the installed capacity is more than 7,000 megawatt. And uh, joint cooperation between a state-owned uh, Thai company, a state-owned uh, China and Myanmar. Look, ninety percent of the uh, electricity will be uh, will be sent or so um, uh, uh, will be sold to uh, the neighboring country. So I really have a big concerns about the because this project is going to be built in the active earthquake. Uh, prone zone. At the same time, the, uh, more importantly, it is a very active uh, ethnic armed groups. Like there are a lot of armed conflict are going on in that area. So it is a uh, very, very challenging, uh, very critical to build a, uh, the mega hydropower project, uh, infrastructure project in a very uh, rich area. And in um, in two uh, yes. Um, in 2016, the environmental impact assessment was conducted by the uh, DOTS party, the Australian EIA company. But uh, it is, uh, they just uh, conduct uh, to just pass the regulations, but not really, uh, really uh, dipping into the human rights approach or environmental consideration. The no, uh, uh, no, according to my uh, observation, my uh, research along the Salawin River, and uh, uh, there, is, there was no uh, meaningful uh, participation from the people, the local people, the potential affected community were not targeted to, uh, uh, to participate in the consultation meeting. They did not get information uh, related to the uh, what is the pro and con of the project. So I would like to wrap up, uh, just give me one more minute. So uh, to wrap up that um, uh, I'm really concerned about the Mung Dun Dam project. It is the international, uh, kind of international cooperation, but the consultation meeting or the EIA did not properly conduct it, especially in the war zone. And um, more importantly, even though in 2015 in Myanmar, uh, environmental impact assessment law was approved, but the government do not have capacity to review the EIA report. At the same time, uh, they do not have uh, capacity to monitor the construction and uh, phase uh, of the uh, uh, when the uh, when the construction is going on. Uh, my last point is um, um, announce uh, there's some remedy. The human rights, uh, human rights and environment defender, they are playing a very important roles to bridge the gaps uh, that we have, and they raise awareness um, uh, to the local community. They also amplify the voices of the community to the uh, to the decision maker and to the policy maker and hold the government and the, um, uh, the, uh, the stakeholder and the investor accountable for the for the activity that they are doing so their life is a very risk but somehow uh, it is very important to uh, for the state to fully uh, protect it and uh, to uh, to support them have a secure life so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Nang, and thanks for sharing the uh, really insightful um, uh, thoughts of the projects that are actually taking place and pointing out a number of different issues, particularly uh, heightening, you know, highlighting the climate crisis and the need for development and how it impacts the future generations. Um, also, the fact of like looking at how looking past the financial cost and also the human cost involved for communities. Uh, I think that sort of linkage we have with the environment really moves us on to our next speaker, uh, Carlo Malalansan, I hope I yeah. said that correctly, who's a social activist uh, from the Philippines, who's been working in the areas of development, environment, climate justice and human rights. Carlo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I'm Carlo from the International Accountability Project, or IAP. Um, IAP is an international human and environmental rights organization that works closely with communities, civil society groups, and social movements to change how development is being done today. Um, thank you for uh, inviting us to speak and share about the experiences of our partners 
and the work that we do. Um, for years, communities and the wider civil society um, have been advocating for um, human rights-based approach in development practice. Um, we, be we believe that if human rights principles are integrated in development process, marginalized um, groups, vulnerable sectors are um, taking part in the design of the project um, before the funding is decided. Um, and it, these projects should benefit the community and should be sensitive to the needs and, um, and um, context of um, impacted communities. In a situation where human rights um, are upheld, communities and civil society would have no difficulties in accessing um, information about a particular project that would affect them. If human rights due diligence is practiced, human and environmental rights defenders do not experience political persecution while accountability, accountability mechanisms are accessible and, um, and functioning. If human rights are respected, governments, um, corporations, and even development finance institutions do not treat free prior and informed consent or FPIC as a mere procedural measure. Rather, FPIC would be viewed as a right that is linked to indigenous people's rights to land, resources, and self-determination. However, we know very well the situation on the ground when it comes to um, infrastructure development projects in Southeast Asia. For instance, rural communities of peasants and indigenous peoples in Cambodia have suffered from massive displacement, land dispossession, loss of livelihood, and erosion of cultural identity brought about by um, the entry and operation of Lower Cezanne and various large-scale plantations. In the Philippines, the Asian Development Bank has supported the construction of New Clark City, a multi-billion infrastructure project that displaced the Aitahungi people from their ancestral lands. Free prior and informed consent process and other community protocols are manipulated at the expense of the community to cater the development narratives and agenda of corporations, governments, and development banks. We have seen this happening across Southeast Asia. Human and environmental rights defenders are criminalized. We have a colleague here from Cambodia who faced judicial harassment because of her active involvement in the defense of their indigenous territories, their life and survival. Community organizers, activists, progressive groups, and even the entire communities are now being red tagged. And we know red tagging has proven to be dangerous because it has translated to physical harm, judicial harassment, and even killing. Now, the government are not just red tagging activists. They are now labeling activists as terrorists. Um, they are doing this basically to malign our credibility and the work that we do to advance um, our right, people's rights to lands and resources. And yet we have seen time and again that not only companies, governments and development banks adequately assess and mitigate environmental and human rights risk. Um, despite existing policies that commit them to doing so, they fail to consult with communities and provide information. Yeah. So recognizing the lack of um, the lack of the right to information uh, for communities, IAP, the Center for International Environmental Law, and nine other civil society groups in Latin America have created the tool for global outreach efforts and collaborations, the Early Warning System, or EWS. The EWS aims to shift who, acts, who has access to data on development projects being proposed and supported by, 15, um, by more than 15 major development banks um, or, in, or institutions operating globally and, and regionally. Um, this is the first public, community-centered, and civil society-led initiative to attempt to bridge these gaps in transparency and accountability. So this is the, the EWS um, website that we have right now. Um, 
on your left yeah, on your left uh, window um, this is an example of what an ews snapshot the snapshot contains a summarized information of a particular project funded by development banks that we monitor of course the ews is not complete because i mean the database is not complete because not all banks are publishing uh, project documents and even the ews um, does not capture other project documents available in banks websites but this is this is how it looks like and we encourage actually civil society and communities to make use of, of uh, the EWS data for their community-led community -led advocacies and campaigns. You may reach out to, to me after this session um, because there is some um, administrative um, requirement to access the database. So this is the EWS project tableau that we have that shows summarized information of projects that we script from um, project documents uh, for example this one is for period january of 2020 until december of 2021 in southeast asia alone uh, we monitored 540 projects with 51 billion us dollar investment um, amount the the project information is further um, categorized by bank and sector so it can be easily um, digest by our partners and of course the communities that we that we try to reach out to yeah likewise iap alongside activists and other partners has also produced community action guide on what is development to help communities define their uh, development priorities. We also have community action guide on community-led research to help start and strengthen community-led actions, especially when it comes to um, advocacies and campaigns. Um, this guide contains tools, um, methodologies, and strategies uh, from, from different community organizers and activists worldwide. So um, aside from access to um, information and meaningful participation of affected communities, a human rights centered approach to development also means that there is adequate and meaningful um, access to remedy where there, is, where there has been any harm by a project. But there are many obstacles to remedy. First, um, it is often difficult for project affected communities to monitor the financing and leverage points um, for accountability associated with the project. Uh, communities have often tried domestic remedies such as court cases without justice. Um, similarly, it is difficult to hold overseas actors like companies, transnational corporations, and even development banks to account. Um, recognizing this accountability gap, the development banks, which finance most of our most of the projects that we monitor, created an, an independent um, accountability mechanism. While they can be valuable tools, um, their mandates are are limited and offer mixed results. Um, from the perspective of of grassroots communities, we need more organized communities who will be at the forefront of pushing for reforms. We know the power of collective actions in bringing substantive um, change. Communities must continue practicing and asserting their right to information and free prior and informed consent and other community protocols. If we want to improve access to remedy, we need to push for an enabling environment where CSO, human rights defenders, and communities could freely exercise their right to free speech, association, and assembly. It is good that we have a space right now where we can talk about the issues that we face in our community. But when we go back to our country, to our community, we will be dealing with surveillance, with intimidation, and other harassment. Connected to the enabling environment, we need to push the government to review and junk repressive policies and laws that prevent us human rights defenders from doing the work that we do. The government should stop weaponizing law against human and environmental rights defenders active in campaign and advocacy around infrastructure development projects. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carla, for those uh, wonderful insights. I think mean, really focusing on the need for civil society, 
Indigenous peoples and human rights defenders' engagement with, these pro with the projects going forward, and the need to see uh, often sometimes critical voices to take into account when talking to large-scale projects. I think that really moves us on to our next speaker, uh, Katia Kuritsi, uh, who is the Deputy Regional Representative of, of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and our focal point for business and human rights. She'll uh, join us virtually. Uh, Katia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and, and a very good afternoon to you all. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, though virtually, and to be part of this important discussion. Um, as we know, and many speakers have mentioned in this and in, in previous sessions, infrastructure projects are often seen as a key plan towards unlocking economic growth, and many involve foreign direct investment. So uncoordinated approaches to macroeconomic management, including infrastructure projects in the region, can not only restrict policy space, but also result in an efficient use of resources, ultimately negatively impacting, impacting the enjoyment of rights by many, especially those more vulnerable. The international human rights framework provides a set of minimum standards governing the quality and inclusiveness of services and helps to delineate the allocation of risk between infrastructure investors, states and communities. So early attention to human rights risks in infrastructure projects can help to avoid uh, social conflict and costly delays and improve project decision making, design and benefits. The Human Rights Framework provides guidelines as well as guardrails for infrastructure policy making, reducing the arbitrariness of decision making and strengthening incentives for better performance and more inclusive and sustainable development. So integrating human rights and environmental considerations into infrastructure projects allows an assessment of proposed aims and avails a mechanism for assessing risks to right holders, which is particularly important for project affected people, such as local communities and workers. This is also a way to encourage transparency and corporate accountability of projects. Without such integration, environmental uh, livelihood and social safeguards may not be sufficient in place to protect against the abuse of human rights and the loss of livelihoods, which can directly affect the right to work and have impact on the rights to food, health and education, just to name a few, and determine the destruction of the environment. This can pose risk to no one being left behind and widen the inequalities between different groups in the region. For example, those living in infrastructure project areas and those in other areas not earmarked for investment. As infra it has been found often in the region that there have been trade-offs between securing finances for economic growth and achieving sustainable inclusive development that advances human rights in particular, hydropower transport projects in several countries in the region have significantly accelerated economic inequalities between urban and rural areas. So what does a human rights-based approach to infrastructure development look like in practice? Depending on the local context, business and human rights frameworks can be an avenue to leverage political economy of natural resources to the benefit or realization of human rights in particular economic, social, and cultural rights. This means that international standards or norms can be used to negotiate to decide outcomes and risk mitigation approaches for projects with the economic, social, and cultural rights, but more broadly, human rights on a 360 degree implications, which can have positive outcomes. In particular, for any environmental and social impact assessment, the length or duration of impacts on affected population is very important to consider. One of the guiding questions for us today is how can right holder access remedy be improved in the infrastructure sector? And on this, we have already again heard uh, a lot by uh, the two previous speakers. But here it's essential to understand what barriers people in the region face when they try to access these remedies. This may be legal barriers where legal system have not been adjusted to deal with complex corporate structures, which often also reach across borders. Sometimes concepts such as due diligence are not well understood or integrated into domestic law. And there is also general need to raise more awareness of this mechanism and how this should function. These are all barriers that can be gradually overcome through capacity development and institutional reforms. However, it is not enough to have formal, well-resourced grievance mechanisms to guarantee 
that rights are protected and fulfilled. This is because these mechanisms do not exist or operate in a vacuum, and they often reflect weaknesses that already exist from before and within the administration of justice and in private and public governance. So even the most well-designed grievance mechanisms cannot function effectively unless they rely on robust laws and institutions and a political environment that supports the rule of law and accountable governance. The effectiveness of remedies and redress mechanisms depends on political and economic power imbalances that often make it very hard for marginalized and vulnerable groups in the region to access justice. And the same groups also often struggle with financial, linguistic, and cultural barriers when they try to avail themselves of given mechanisms, be they judicial or non-judicial. So to be effective, these mechanisms need to be part of a broader effort to ensure that the various parts of the national accountability structure, especially the judiciary, can function as they should. And it is also important to recall that any meaningful grievance mechanism must provide effective remedies and redress for victims of abuse. These challenges are faced even more significantly by indigenous people in the region because of the long history of systematic discrimination and human rights violations in the name of development and infrastructure projects. The level of mistrust of communities with infrastructure sector actors is high. Therefore, there needs to be effort put in place by duty bearers, policymakers, business actors, as well as indigenous people's organizations to bridge that gap and foster an enabling environment to build and strengthen trust and genuine partnership by ensuring the participation of indigenous peoples, women and youth in all decision-making processes of development. A better understanding is also required that indigenous peoples are not just stakeholders, but right holders. And they should be given central roles and responsibility in management and decision-making in infrastructure development, taking place in territories across Southeast Asia. This is critical to upholding the rights of all persons belonging to disadvantaged and marginalized groups in the region, not only indigenous groups. Individuals and groups have a right to access information and participate in decisions that affect their lives and well being. True and meaningful participation requires legal awareness and empowerment. And it also demands that people concerned can fully exercise the rights to freedom of expression, assembly, and association. Some of the, of the most serious hurdles for people to claim their rights relate to their inability to access justice mechanisms and find effective remedies for their grievances, especially when marginalized communities are up against the interests of big corporations and their allies within the government structures. This is where the power imbalances in many Southeast Asian countries manifest themselves most starkly. The situation is further compounded by the prohibitive costs involved in challenging injustice in relation to land, housing, and environmental degradation. The high degree of intra-regional trade and investment in Southeast Asia gives rise to further complications when people try to challenge foreign companies that operate across national borders and sometimes in a jurisdictional gray zone. Fear of reprisal, aggression, intimidation, and criminalization of individuals or community members that seek to access the remedy remains a critical concern in the region. International and regional financial institutions are an important source of funding for large-scale development initiatives, including infrastructure projects, the extraction of natural resources, forestry, and agriculture and victims of human rights violations are increasingly demanding that these institutions review their loans to companies implicated in such abuses. As investments in infrastructure begin to increase after the pandemic, this could be an opportunity to encourage better human rights protection approaches. Uh, for instance, in 2021 only, East Asia and the Pacific received a total of uh, 28.1 US dollar billion in investment across 89 projects, which makes it 196% uh, uh, increase from 2020. So 
supporting a human rights based approach to infrastructure development and preventing business related human rights abuses in Southeast Asia requires stronger and more rigorous human rights due diligence uh, across the board, including using possibly as reference recent instruments such as the EU Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence. This recent directive aims to foster sustainable and responsible corporate behavior and to anchor human rights and environmental considerations in companies' operations and corporate governance. The new rules ought to ensure that businesses address the adverse impact of their actions, including in the value chains inside and outside Europe. The development, adoption, and implementation of national action plans in the region also provide an important avenue to support a human rights-based approach to infrastructure development by upholding the UN guiding principles. And lastly, an integrated approach to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda uh, jointly with uh, uh, upholding the UN guiding principles in the domestic legislation and policies is, uh, is also critical. Uh, our regional office uh, uh, is uh, actively engaged with all of our partners in the region to continue promoting a human rights-based approach to development infrastructure. And, and we really look forward to continue working uh, with you all to um, pursue this common goal together. So I will stop here and uh, um, I look forward to the continuation of the discussion and also uh, happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katia. And thanks for highlighting uh, the, really the way in which the human rights uh, interlinkages between economic, social, cultural rights, civil and political rights and the need for those to be incorporated at the very start of any uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, touched on a, men a number of issues, uh, particularly the discriminatory barriers that indigenous people and uh, vulnerable and marginalized communities face. Uh, and this has um, quite a link to our next speaker who's going to talk about institutional reform uh, and the ways in which this is needed to do, be work with all different stakeholders in order to achieve this. So she'll be joining us online uh, and um, she is joining us from Transparency International Australia, Anne Griffin, uh, who is uh, working on accountability and infrastructure projects, uh, working on eliminating corporate, uh, corporate risk uh, for infrastructure projects. Uh, Anna, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and before I started, I would like to just, um, as is customary here in Australia, uh, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you today, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And we do that here in Australia as a way of um, reminding ourselves that we are on stolen land and to try and um, come to terms with um, the, the huge human rights abuses that have happened um, throughout our um, recent history here as well. Um, I uh, was given the role to get, provide a bit of a summary of, of what has been said today and then also to then share with you a little bit about our work um, at Transparency International. So I just wanted to say um, firstly that um, it's really important to hear the, the accounts from, from Nang Wan Lee and from Carlo Manalasam about um, the challenges that they face in their work and, and the real human impacts of um, when human rights and environmental considerations are not adequately um, implemented in infrastructure projects and also the challenges that human rights and environmental defenders face and the harassment and the, the risk to their life and uh, that they also face as well. Um, and I think that really brings it to the forefront of our minds that when we're working in this space and that when we're advocating to um, increase or strengthen ESG approaches and to call for better ESIAs and mitigation plans that these examples um, uh, that they've shared with us demonstrate the real human consequences and that these corporatized mechanisms um, need to be meaningful and need to really ensure that people are the forefront of people's minds when we're talking about these issues with companies and governments and, and financiers as well. Um, I think there's a lot that we have to be concerned about when it comes to human rights impacts of infrastructure projects. Um, that there's, there's, we've heard about um, forced relocations and people being cut off from their communities, the risks to people who are um, trying to stand up for people's rights as well. Um, and I think also another big risk that we have with infrastructure is the effects on, of climate change 
um, that we're witnessing in real time at the moment um, as we're seeing more severe weather events um, happening more frequently, um, including right now devastating floods in Pakistan and droughts in other parts of the world, as well as really severe storms. So we need to be really um, aware of the type of infrastructure that we're building and where it's being built and ensuring that we're accounting for these severe weather events and making sure that they can withstand these storms. I know that um, in Australia, where I um, am, in the northeast coast, we've suffered from extreme um, floods last summer, and it looks like it will happen again. So we're starting to have to have these discussions around whether or not um, people need to relocate uh, or rebuild because the, the, the costs of rebuilding, the financial, economic costs of rebuilding, as well as psychological um, costs of rebuilding start to become quite huge. So these are challenging discussions that we're having to have in terms of climate change and infrastructure, but they need to happen as well. Um, alongside some of the challenges, I think there's a lot of opportunities and um, Katia touched on some of them as well um, about, you know, infrastructure being used as a mechanism to achieve the sustainable development goals to um, wrap up spending post-COVID. Um, and there's a huge need in our region, in the Asia Pacific region, um, for increased elect electrification, better water and sanitation, um, more telecommunications, you know, access via roads and, 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 and things to schools, to workplaces and to markets. And all of these things will help raise people out of poverty. Um, there's a huge need for infrastructure globally and um, it can help to address the sustainable development goals, but it won't happen unless we ensure that human rights and environmental considerations are integrated into projects from the start. It's also really pleasing that throughout this discussion, we've been talking about that early stage of infrastructure projects when they're selected, that um, oftentimes that is a forgotten um, part of the discussion, but it's, it's a really crucial part of the discussion. Um, it's, it was interesting for me to hear about the work that the International Accountability Project is doing on community action guides and early warning system to really empower communities to insert themselves into the, the planning process for projects um, and, and um, to insist that community needs and concerns and their priorities are taken into account. Um, the process of empowering communities to do their own research and determine their own development priorities and respond to unwanted projects is really exciting, I think, and, and I'm really interested to look more into the work of, of um, the International Academy Project to see how um, some of our work aligns, because um, we're also doing some work um, at, at, with to empower communities to be able to insert themselves into that decision making phase of infrastructure projects. So that leads me into talking a little bit about my work and um, that we're doing at um, Transparency International Australia on our accountability infrastructure project. And through this project, we've developed an infrastructure corruption risk assessment tool, um, which is, as I said, trying to empower communities to participate in the decision-making process and insist that their needs and priorities are taken into account, um, including mitigating measures um, as appropriate. Uh, our tool is focused on um, corruption and highlighting the risk factors to corruption, um, but we know that um, where corruption happens, the results of this are often adverse human rights impacts and adverse environmental outcomes. Um, so that's for me where the link is. So we have developed um, this tool. We're looking at the early stage of infrastructure projects because um, we know that infrastructure projects are highly corruption prone. There's a huge amount of money invested in it and the flow and effects over the life of a project if corruption gets in at that stage can lead to huge cost blowouts, inefficiencies, poor quality or white elephant projects. Um, and then as well, because as I've seen Previously, most anti-corruption efforts are focused at the contracting stage or procurement stage or construction stage and not at that earlier stage where the decisions are made, where I think um, we can have a really good impact. So we've developed this infrastructure corruption risk assessment tool that we um, uh, have developed worked with a group of consultants um, from Engineers Against Poverty, which is linked to the infrastructure transparency um, initiative called COST. Um, and they've developed this tool uh, that is 
um, intended to be adaptable across contexts and capacity. So we're going to be implementing this tool and we've started work to do that in Indonesia and also in the Solomon Islands, which are very obviously different contexts. Um, but as well as being adaptable across context, we uh, wanted the tool to be rigorous and detailed enough to be meaningful. Um, we're, we've targeted for a civil society user to be able to gather this information and to assess how decisions have been made. But we also see it as being really useful for governments and, and businesses as well, for governments to assess their own decision-making processes and to see where they can um, improve weaknesses and highlight their strengths. And for businesses and for financiers to understand the risk better of investing in certain areas. Um, our project, um, our tool assesses projects on 14 different project aspects. Um, and the ones that are, I think, most relevant to the human rights and environmental um, impact um, are purpose and need, the type and location of a project, the size and scope, whether or not it's fit for purpose, is the timing right? Have they chosen the right project for the right time or perhaps another one would be more useful at this moment in time? Who are the beneficiaries and what are the adverse impacts and have they considered impact mitigation um, processes and mechanisms? And is it, what is the cost and value? So um, the tool has a whole range of different guiding questions to help those civil society users to ask those questions, to delve into how that decision was made um, and to, to really draw out um, where they could have done better. And, and through that process to call on um, better approaches and better um, community consultation that is real and meaningful to ensure that they really do meet the needs um, of the community. So the tool draws out um, or highlights where the corruption red flags are. Um, and we're looking at where there might have been undue influence in the selection process. Um, and, and we know that if there is that undue influence where if projects are built or decided on, on, on terms that are not um, uh, based on, on need, that the, out, the impacts on the community can be quite poor. Um, so we're looking for things like um, uh, a failure to present viable project alternatives or manipulating designs to produce incomplete plans or inaccurate cost estimates. We're looking at manipulating environmental, social and impact assessments where you know, impacts have been misrepresented um, to downplay the effects on the environment or communities. Um, the, another red flag is by, bypassing budget processes to avoid or impede external um, scrutiny. Avoiding disclosure of project plans under the guise of national security or commercial confidentiality, or postponing, fast tracking, and sidestepping exempting regulatory clearances to favour specific interests. Um, so, all of these are red flags for where corruption can occur. I think this postponing and fast tracking thing is, um, it is one that we're seeing more and more frequently, particularly post COVID, where we're seeing that um, there's an urgency to, to build and quickly, um, but in doing so often they are bypassing those critical um, uh, consultations with community and, and, and critical regulatory processes that do protect the environment and, and social um, outcomes. So in our work, we are working with, as I said, the Solomon Islands and Indonesia to implement this tool. Um, and from our colleagues in the Solomon Islands, they've told us that um, the, the projects that are built under um, international and donor funds are really highly politicised. Um, and because of this, um, oftentimes it, it, projects are, built, uh, are selected for um, political purposes rather than purely based on need. And that can lead to poor quality infrastructure that's not fit for purpose. And there's also a huge um, issue around cost blowouts um, and unexplained costs. But questions around transparency and consultation and proper process are really um, key there as well. In Indonesia, we're taking a, a slightly different approach where we're looking at a national strategic fast tracking approach to infrastructure projects where um, projects that are considered of national strategic importance are fast tracked um, and they can then bypass some of these regulatory processes, which we know are risks then for corruption, but then also for human rights and environmental impacts. So, um, we're looking into how this happens, how a project gets selected and who is making these decisions.
So we're hoping that through these um, activities, we'll draw out some information on how decisions are made, how projects are selected, and that information will be used by communities to advocate for increased transparency, the adoption of better processes and decision making that has human rights and environmental impacts at its forefront. And so that infrastructure projects can provide real benefit to communities, which should be the um, the whole purpose of, of infrastructure projects um, itself. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you very much, Anna, and thanks very much for summing up all the points of the participants and the panelists, um, and also for sharing the work of Transparency International and some of the toolkits you've developed. Uh, I think one thing that's really coming across from all the discussions and from the different panelists is the need for infrastructure, but the way in which it's done, is it done in a sustainable way and does it protect human rights from the very start? Is it actually a project that's going to advance human rights, the protection and promotion of human rights? Uh, so we have a, a very small amount of time, uh, five minutes or so, but I'd like to open the floor for any questions. That, uh, people, please raise your hands if you would like to ask a question. Go ahead. Um, hi, um, I have a question to our friend from the Philippines. I would like to learn more about uh, access to remedy that, that um, you know, for affected communities. So the problem is, is uh, whether the problem is about the lack of an effective access to remedy um, or is it something else? And I also would like you to elaborate a little bit more about the grievance mechanism of um, international development banks, like what are their limitations? And if you cannot get access to remedy from there, where would you go next? Because we have heard uh, Professor Diva talking about the uh, pressing point. So I just would like to know how you would identify the, um, you know, the pressing point uh, for to get remedy for um, affected communities. Thank you. Thank you, Maroj. I'll take uh, one or two more questions before we move to the panelists. Uh, I think there was a hand over here first. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Laurent, the Secretariat Coordinator of Cambodian Indigenous People Alliance. So I want to just to add up to what the speaker have said about the <coughs> how the government and also the companies not really implement the prepare or inform consent to us. Are the indigenous people we are really affect uh, <coughs> most of the <coughs> project, especially the medium and large scale uh, mining project move to increasingly uh, remote area that uh, really threaten to generate uh, adverse impact on the land and natural resource uh, to us. So the company and uh, the government, they reject to implement the free flow and form concern us. That is very uh, the principle that really need to be uh, implemented. Yeah. So <coughs> actually, if we have a, uh, a chance or is any uh, uh, agency or uh, or NGO that can help us to talk to the company. We also want to tell them that uh, they still can can implement the prepare or informed consent. Uh, they no need to uh, afraid of that. Yeah, um, but the government they said this is uh, <coughs> the principle of uh, of the national that they 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 don't want to implement it and most of the company they don't want also but there is a case that we try uh, our Jerai indigenous community uh, who are affected by the the mining uh, with the onco resource corp uh, previously known as the onco gold company um, we come up with the negotiation and uh, the company they they agree to have the consultation with us and then we come up with the agreement. Uh, that is a good point uh, for us to apply the prior informed consent as the, the case that uh, we can learn from that, that case for us, yeah. So only the Canadian uh, uh, company that, that start to, to implement uh, this uh, uh, principle for now for Cambodia. So maybe uh, the question, uh, is that do you have any uh, uh, NGO or maybe the the UN that can be the channel for us to continue the negotiation like this between the IP and the company for the future? Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'll take one last question before we go to the, uh, the person at the back. 
Sir, uh, I am from Assam, Northeast India. I am representing Thai home community as a Secretary General of Indian Peoples of Mungdun Sunkham. So in uh, Northeastern region, it is not the corporate. The government of India himself, itself violates the norms of FPIC and guiding principles of business and human rights and the business and human rights with due diligence. Because uh, after so many protests from the indigenous peoples of Northeast, uh, there is near about 170 big dams, which is under the NSPC. It's going on. Again, uh, due to the oil leakage and the fire from the, our Gulf of India undertaking institutions just like Oil India and ONGC, the indigenous people suffer most. Again, there after the so many decisions in the UN office. Sorry, as, excuse me, just to stop you. Sorry, we're okay. running out of time, so please could you frame it as a question, please? That'd be useful, so I could answer. Okay. So, uh, what, 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 what will be your decision in this meeting that we, the Indians, will get the justice from the UNDP regarding the violation of human rights in Northeast India and FPIC and the UN guiding principles on business and human rights? Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I'll pass the first question over. That was over to you, Carla, and I think we'll move on from that. So to answer the first question, um, they they actually one of our partners um, um, tried to to bring these issues at the local court because of some violations happening. There was no free prior informed consent before the infrastructure project entered their community. So they tried that. Um, however, it wasn't really successful. They demanded for compensation and and. Um, and uh, yeah, compensation, but it was not um, properly given to them. Um, the next step would be uh, the, the one that we assisted the community is to trigger the accountability mechanism of the bank that support, that, su that provided finance to, to the project. Um, right now, um, it was first uh, done through the dispute resolution, but the limitation is that in the dispute resolution process of of the bank, we need to bring in um, stakeholders like governments, um, the banks, um, corporations, and the communities to sit together and talk about this and try to negotiate. However, in that um, in that um, negotiation, the the government does not want to sit and discuss the issue. So that alone is not really that um helpful for the community who um who was impacted by the project um so there these are some of the limitations that we face uh, that we encountered uh, once we deal with um independent accountability accountability mechanisms of of the, the of development banks um yeah thank you carla i think nang you would like to tackle the, the final last question we had Yes, uh, thank you for all of your uh, questions. Um, as uh, earlier in, in, in the morning, uh, many speakers, as well as now, uh, many people said that uh, it is um, the volunt uh, voluntary uh, measure doesn't work at all. So it is now to do uh, to uh, to move to the compulsory compulsory um, uh, measure. Yes. Uh, I totally agree that uh, to transform, uh, it is now to transform the guideline, law, or regulations into the action. It is very important that uh, we have a free prior informed consent at uh, this guideline, but some other um, uh, company, uh, some investor, they don't really practice um, um, in, in the ground. But now I think it is a, a it is good that we have this kind of a space to discuss and we should really improve this uh, regulation into actions. Um, uh, as, uh, as many people said that uh, voluntary, vo voluntary uh, mechanism or voluntary uh, measure uh, doesn't work, so we have to really move on it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, uh, there was a question relating to uh, what avenues human rights mechanisms are available. So I'd like to pass that over to Katia uh, for that final question. Thank you, Robert. 
Um, of course, the engagement with international human rights mechanisms is a key avenue to, to pursue. And uh, from that perspective, our office is always very keen and ready to help strengthening that, um, that engagement, uh, uh, operating as a sort of enabling uh, actor in the, in the, in the region. Um, of course, the issues that we have been uh, discussing today um, are relevant to a number of uh, um, UN special procedures, for instance, and there it's important to strategically uh, think through a, a device strategy which would look at involving them both bilaterally, but possibly also pursuing opportunities for having um, an engagement of more than one special procedure on, uh, on specific cases at hand. Um, but for sure, um, it is an extremely important avenue to pursue from a UN human rights framework perspective, uh, a leading one. Thank you. Thank you, Katia. I think uh, finally, just to say, I think uh, we've heard a lot of interesting points right now about the need for the right to development for infrastructure projects, but in the, how are they actually produced and are they done in a sustainable way? Is it in collaboration with a, are they, you know, the right to a healthy and sustainable environment? Uh, is it actually benefiting the populations that they serve? So uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for their inputs today. I really enjoyed hearing from everybody and thank you very much. Thank you.